This afternoon, uh, I'd like to share with all of you all a story. A story about four wise monkeys. <laughs> I thank them very much for having spent quality time with me and shared the experiences and, not, and allowed me uh, into their world. The first of them was Mitsaru, a very successful entrepreneur who runs a massive textile operation. He was in a great mood until I pointed out that the wastewater from his plant was being discharged directly into the local river and it was devastating the local environment. The sludge from his plant was totally hazardous and was being recklessly dumped into landfills, which was creating groundwater contamination. The neighborhood and the people in the neighborhood were falling ill frequently because of the pollution that was being discharged by his factory as well as the others in the neighborhood. The dormitories that housed his workers were uninhabitable. Of course, Mitsaru was in total denial. And instead, he invited me to his home <laughs> and um, decided to give me his point of view, which basically meant that I'm not in this alone. Everybody does it. And the cause for this are the ridiculously low prices that my clients keep on thrusting on me every single day. I have to survive. This prompted me to meet his top client, Kikazaru, a fashion mogul, Ivy League school bred, runs a very successful brand on Bull Street. He was also in a great mood until um, I pointed out that uh, the NGO activist group Red Peace had labeled his brand as a detox loser. He brushed aside my comments effortlessly and basically said that his organization has a plan to move from a detox loser to a green washer and eventually a detox leader. He had bought time till 2020. I don't think he was impressed. He was pretty annoyed when I pointed out that thousands of people had lost their lives in a factory crash in Bangladesh, which did most of his production and he was visibly unimpressed when I pointed out that workers had lost their lives in Bambodia. And some of them came from the factories that produced his goods. I'm sure he didn't want to listen to any more. Instead, he invited me over his private jet to explain his point of view. And basically, he pointed the finger in the direction of global lawmakers. And he basically said that his organization gave orders in countries, and he helped those countries to develop employment. So he was doing the right thing. He also defended his position by saying that the factories that he gave business to were legally registered in those countries, and he wasn't doing the wrong thing. So when I imposed on him, he said that I should really be speaking to a lawmaker, it was their problem. That prompted me to meet Eva Zaru, a lawmaker. We've had some great discussions and, you know, while uh, he totally accepted the problems that faced uh, Mitsaru and Kikazaru's businesses, which revolved around human rights as well as compliance issues, he pointed out that uh, there was a bigger problem at, at hand with these guys. They were, there was no place to hold on to the millions and millions of tons of garments that was being thrown into landfills. Besides occupying space, he was extremely concerned about the gases and the toxins that were getting emanated from this waste. I asked him, why is there so much waste? And then he basically said, well, it's because of mass production and human needs and consumption. And then, when I pointed out that with this mass consumption and repeated urgency to produce, 
There were companies like Nontanto who were now creeping into the environment and creating collateral damage which was irreparable. He also brushed my theory that one day we would be living in a planet surrounded by environmental refugees. He also said that there was a way that we all had to probably work together to create an environmental law. I thought it was a great idea. So I engaged with him on why we could not have an environmental law that was watertight, not only locally, but globally. He said, well, it was being discussed in parliament, and these things take a lot of time. So much for his commitment, I walked out empty-handed. But he sought my commitment towards contribution for his re-election shortly. Well, he did. did a, he, he did point me in the direction of uh, Shizaru, and he did say that change was on its way. When I met with Shizaru, I found him mulling over his, um, his current sustainability strategy. He was pretty excited with the orphanage that they had just set up, built in partnership with a shoe company that believed in converting waste material. The shoes were built on a non-profit basis, and it houses, it houses over 150 children today. He also explained to me that we had to move forward. Eco-efficiency was part of the system, but it was not a solution because surely, steadily, and quietly, one way or the other, our resources would get depleted. In his opinion, he thought that the best way to handle things would be to create positive impact and tilt the scales to create an impact that was measurable in a sustainable fashion. He thought the best way to go about it was to be surrounded with great minds, invest deeply into environmental education, work collaborat collaboratively with research partners and, ac and, and academics, which would eventually help him to build a net positive environmental balance sheet. As I walked through his plant, he exposed a unique grid, a water grid, which basically was on the verge of recycling 100% of the water. What was more thrilling on testing was that this water was purer than the WHO standards, totally fluoride as well as uh, arsenic free. And even more exciting was the proposition to ship the excess water to places which were ridden and stricken with drought. The sludge from his factory was tested non-hazardous. And with the sludge, the sludge was being converted into bricks, and bricks were being utilized to build homes for the deserving. Economically, he shared that with investments of a little over $3 million, they had already broken even and had a tremendous ROI of 33%. In the old plant, they would have spent, for the current levels of production, 6 million genes a year, approximately a million dollars towards purchase of water, treatment of water, as well as disposal of sludge. In the current state, they were spending about $350,000 a year. With the economic results, he was further propelled to invest into modern technology to scale up production. Lasers, robots, ozone, as well as nanobubbles to build a completely new age waterless product. He also shared that they had saved over 5 million kilowatts in current times. The ROI here was even better, 
40%. The money came back in 2.6 years. Simple measures, aerial drying, recycling waste heat and waste steam, working with a furniture factory to create biomass and indulging in a process which was totally circular. Investments on sol solar thermal as well as photovoltaic allowed him to further invest for his 5,000 workforce with electric bikes. Of course, on one of them, I toodled around, and Shizaru, before leaving, encouraged me to plant a tree. With all this overdose of information, I thought I had to sit back and write my report. One of the big things that came to me was that we live in precarious times where there seem to be no limits on greed. Factories and societies have become extremely inclusive and selfish and have no correlation to their decisions on a day-to-day -day basis on, a, on our planet as well as our fellow planetarians. I felt it was time to break down these walls. There wasn't enough education around. My children, when I look at their curriculum, I see they get advanced with science, math, history, religion. So I think that there is a big need to overhaul our education system and embed environment, sustainability, and practices that would preserve our planet. Well, it escalated a little bit more, and I published a book, and I titled it To Be or Not To Be. The apparel business today, globally, is over $1 trillion. By 2025, in a report that McKinsey published, the business would increase, would double, to a tad over $2 trillion. With all that was going on, I thought it was time for me to write my sequel. Of course, I must let you know that my report figured in the monkey times, and it will be aired on MNN shortly. My sequel, of course, this time around, will be with an elephant and six blind men of Hindustan who were learning much inclined, who went to see an elephant, though all of them were blind. Thank you very much. <laughs>